So monopolies. Um, I'm just gonna come out and say it right away. I don't believe that monopolies could effectively form and exist uh, and operate successfully for any length of time on a free market. The reason I believe it is twofold. One, there's a solid uh, theoretical explanation for why that's in an incorrect view. And second of all, there's plenty of historical evidence to support the premise. So let's start with theory. So the, the story goes like this. On a free market, a company could um, capture enough market share to drive out competitors and drive out competitors and then uh, it would just have its way with the consumer, meaning it would raise prices and cut production. And the consumers would suffer. So, um, okay, why would it have to cut production, not just raise prices? Well, because the consumer, you know, if you, if, you, if you look at like demand and supply uh, curves, if you want to get technical about it, um, you know, if, if the consumers en masse were willing to spend more money on a particular good than they're spending right now, then uh, without creating a monopoly, the producer could just raise the price. And he would, you know, the, uh, that that price would still not result in falling total revenue. Um, obviously, that doesn't happen. You know, you, you, since they're not doing it, they're not raising the price. They've achieved a profit, uh, a revenue maximizing price, uh, and therefore any increase in price would uh, result in a decrease of a quantity of goods purchased, a qu qu a quantity of goods demanded. So the dream of a monopolist, according to anti-market people, is to drive out all competitors and then, once they have established a mon mon monopolistic position, just raise the price of income production, have people buy less with more uh, and pay more for it. And uh, the consumers would obviously suffer. Okay, well, uh, I think in order to, in order to prove that a uh, free market is conducive to monopolies, you have to show... Uh, well, basically, you have to prove your case, right? You have to uh, illustrate. You have to. You have to demonstrate um, that this situation for a monopolist would be uh, stable and sustainable. Um, there's a lot of problems with this with this simple position. I I think it basically on its face, it's it's implausible. Uh, the the most important thing is this. Um, what would prevent Competitors from coming into be coming to be from arising, in order to compete for the same dollars. Let's say you're 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 a producer of and seller of widgets that uh, have a certain demand, right? And let's say you've achieved your monopoly position. So you're the sole seller of those widgets uh, on the market. People demand those those widgets, and they're paying you the high price, right? Well, the high price with the lower production means that your profits are going up, right? Your profit per item produced is now higher because you're producing less of them but selling them at a higher price point. So your profits are, you know, generally will tend to be higher. And that's the whole point of being a monopolist because you can command, uh, you, you can realize higher profits. Well, what's to stop another firm from forming and uh, entering the market and selling the same, producing and selling the same product? Let's say their cost of production are, you know, similar to yours. If they offer the product at a lower price point, they can take away your entire market. What's to stop them from doing that? And he, I think I'm giving away my case right away uh, because the, the, you know, in reality, monopolists have only existed with the support of the government because the government is the only entity that can just prohibit competition. I, you know, every single businessman would love to prohibit competition, only they can't. Okay, like in the free market, nobody's going to be angels. You know, people are not going to be angels. People are still going to be greedy and bad sometimes. But the thing about the market and the free competition, as long as it's free entry, like if 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 I'm producing uh, some kind of product or service, I want to charge as much as I possibly can. Right? I'm going to work as little as I can and get as as much money as I can for my work. Okay, preferably do no work whatsoever and get loads and loads and loads of money. Well. Good luck, <laughs> right? If you can convince people to give you money for nothing, that's great for you, I guess. But uh, most people will fail if they attempt something like that. So you have to offer people something that they want, something that they will willingly part with the money to give to you in exchange for that product. Um, unless, of course, you force them, like you put a gun to their head. Well, you know, 
that's a whole other story. Uh, but cursive monopolies in a free market is a very, very implausible idea. But the real monopolies have existed with the support of the coercive power of government. The government would just forcibly prohibit competition and restrict entry into, entry into the marketplace, thereby creating a space for a monopoly to develop. But let's look at the free market monopoly, so quote unquote. Well, first of all, there's you know monopoly is a very emotionally charged term. People hear the word monopoly and they go, oh, monopoly bad. Ooh, they feel uneasy about monopolies. Again, I'm referring to a conversation I had with my brother-in-law earlier today. Well, it's yesterday because it's, uh, it's what it's two o'clock in the morning. It's two o'clock in the morning. Jesus. Anyway, um, yeah. So he was talking like he was talking to his friend at work, who's sort of you know curious about libertarianism but unsure, and he like has a lot of problems. Like, what about monopolies? And like, okay, what about monopolies? Like, why don't you ask him what about monopolies? What exactly is bad about monopoly? Well, we just explained it. The, the, the bad thing about monopoly is that monopolies can raise price and cut production, have people pay more for less, and therefore suffer. Uh, okay, fine. How would that monopolist accomplish that? How would he get them to pay more for less? I mean, physically, you know, how, how is it going to happen? And give me an example of a, of a free market monopoly that did that. And then they go, oh, Standard Oil, John D. Rockefeller. And then I just have to laugh because because John D. Rockefeller didn't do anything like that at all. He did nothing of the sort. He did not cut production and raise prices. He raised production and cut prices. So what you have with Rockefeller and Standard Oil is that Rockefeller basically single-handedly created uh, the oil industry. Right? He was a fanatical genius, I would even say. He was completely fanatical about uh, improving the processes, the technology, and the uh, management methods of his company to do what? To accomplish what? To cut his costs, to improve efficiency, to be able to produce more with less Right to spend more in production, produce more of the product. In that, in his case, it was kerosene mostly. What res which resulted in the kerosene prices uh, over the course of well twenty something years being cut by a factor of seven. Again, uh, I, th I think it was by a factor of seven. So we're, we're not talking about seven percent or one seventh, which would be fifteen percent. No, seven times. The kerosene was seven times cheaper. I may be wrong a little bit on the numbers here, but you can easily look it up, and if you know, I'll stand corrected if you if you, if you correct me. Uh, but he he, you know, he, what he did resulted in the kerosene price dropping dramatically over the course of a couple of decades, which made kerosene avail, uh, 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 affordable to poor people. Poor pe poor people. There's always more poor people than rich people. So if you want to get rich, find something that the poor people can buy, and you'll get rich. Sam Walton. John D. Rockefeller selling kerosene to like workers who could now use kerosene lamps instead of uh, uh, whale oil. I think I think Rockefeller should be credited with saving the world's whales. I think that's actually a, a pretty real scenario. I think he actually did save them. But anyway, that's, that's a whole other topic. So yeah, uh, Rockefeller didn't do nothing of the sort. Yeah, he did hold over ninety percent of the oil market in the U.S. at some point. Not at the end of his career. Not when they started the antitrust case against him. By by that time, his market share actually dropped, and I'll go into why in a minute. But yeah, he did hold over ninety percent of the market. So freaking what? Okay, he lowered the freaking price of the kerosene. He made it available, uh, uh, affordable to everybody. What's not to like? I mean, what's the what's the problem exactly? Well, oh oh oh, but he could. Uh, but he could have done different. Well, he didn't do differently. Okay, he didn't raise the price. He didn't cut production. He tremendously raised production, and decimated the price. Okay, so I don't see any problem with that kind of monopoly. If there's monopolies, you know, the literal translation is one seller. Okay, if there's one seller who's doing everybody good, what's the freaking problem? Okay, this is we should stop being so emotional about the term monopoly. Just because there's, who cares how many sellers? Look, you go to the market, you buy stuff that you need. Do you care how many people are producing that stuff? No, you don't. You care about the quality and the price and availability. That's what you care about. And as long as those things are there, who cares how many people are producing? That's a that, uh, that's an, a completely artificial problem. Um, but the the other uh, thing that people love to bring up about monopolies, and that's I, I love this. I I, can, I love this. Okay, uh, it's it's fabulous. Back after a short break.
Yeah, so the other thing is um, that is brought up uh, frequently when people are talking about monopolies is, oh, there's predatory pricing. Predatory pricing is supposed to be this method uh, by which uh, monopolists can establish their monopolies. What, what they're supposedly able to do is they can cut the price of their product so low, right, so as to be selling at a loss thereby driving everybody out of business. Why can they do that? Well, because they're big and they have like huge stockpiles of cash or something. They can afford to lose money on some of their sales. So that's what they would do. Um, and they, so they'll, they'll do that. They'll drop the price uh, to a point where it's they're actually losing money on every sale. And their competitors just have to shut down. They just have to shut down. And once the competitors are gone, they raise the price through the roof and enjoy their monopoly privilege. Well, okay. Who says that the, the competitors have to shut down for good? Who says that the competitors have to liquidate? Let's say you're an oil company and you're competing, you're a big oil company and you're competing against like a bunch of small oil companies. And yeah, let's say you drop the price of oil uh, below, let's say below your cost of production. So you're losing money on every sale of oil and your competitors, if they want to compete with you, they can't s sell at a price higher than yours because, you know, that doesn't make any sense. People will not buy from them. They will keep buy from me, buying from you at a low price at which you're losing money, right? But who says that they have to shut down forever? Why can't they just shut down for a while, maybe let go some of their workers, maybe all of their workers, and wait you out, okay? Um, I think that's as plausible as anything. Also, if you're, if you're selling a commodity on the market at this uh low price what's to stop them from starting to buy those that commodity from you at that low price what's to stop? Yeah, and they can just start stockpiling it and they're not only waiting you out they're benefiting from your loss okay they're actually directly benefiting from the the uh very tactic that's supposed to ruin them um so they could just let go of some of their workers and use the money to I don't know build or buy or lease uh, like warehousing facilities to store your product they just keep buying from you and buying from you and buying from you and they can pull resources together do that if they don't have enough of a stockpile of cash on their own or something they can pull their resources and just keep buying and buying and bleeding you dry <laughs> and, and, and and mind you you're losing money in every sale and there's no guarantee that you're gonna recoup that by extra high profits later because those guys are not going anywhere like, that would be the stupidest thing ever if anybody uh, attempted to do that. In fact, there's at least one example that I know of where people did attempt to do that. And that's a story I'm going to link to in the description about the uh, Dow Chemical, how they were competing, they were producing bromine, uh, a chemical used in the development of, of film, uh, with a German concern that was trying to undercut them. And German concern was trying to, to stop them from competing uh, against them, stop Dow from competing against them in, in some markets. And they, th um, if my recollection is correct, they threatened to dump their product on the U.S. market at such a low price that Dow would have to go out of business. Dow said, uh, you can try. And they did. And Dow started buying up their product. And they saw that pretty quickly. And they stopped and said, look, look, okay, we, we take it back. We don't want to fight. We don't want a war. Let's just say, why don't you, why don't you just, you know, stay out of a couple of our markets. And outside of that, you can, you can do whatever you please. And Dow said, sure. <laughs> so uh, that's just a stupid, stupid, stupid idea. It needs to be exposed. Every time you hear it, you have to expose it. Like uh, Economically, it doesn't make any sense. Any sense. Nobody ever succeeded uh, in, 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 in driving out their competitors by doing that. Okay, So that falls apart. So I think uh, we are able to show pretty successfully that on a free market, as long as there's unrestricted entry into the market, there's no way a monopoly can remain a monopoly. And by the way, why did uh, Rockefeller's market share decline? Uh, my understanding is that Rockefeller's company got so big that their efficiencies, like the bigness, the return on the bigness, uh, we're dealing with a diminishing return on the bigness, right? You are losing, you're beginning to lose efficiencies after a certain point. Yeah, you know, you, you're, you're integrating uh, maybe very successfully, you're vertically integrating your your your, your company, but after a certain point, um, think about it as a variant of Ludwig von Mises's calculation argument. Right, the the argument goes like this: a socialist economy, in absence of a market on capital goods and means of production, is unable to rationally allocate resources because there's no way to calculate 
either what to produce, whether that's going to be profitable or not, or how to produce. Once you, 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 you know, even if you decide what to produce, how to produce it, what methods to use, what technology to use, what materials to use, what machines to use, what processes to use. There's no way to rationally decide these things in the absence of a uh, system of prices for means of production. And by definition, in a socialist economy, the means of production are owned by one entity, the state, and therefore the state is going to be allocating those resources irrationally which is exactly why, if you look at my USSR videos, which is exactly why the Soviet economy was unable to produce you know, anything beyond abject poverty uh, for its uh, consumers, for its society. It was not able to produce the most trivial consumer goods for the masses of the population. It was not capable of rationally allocating resources and producing what, you know, things that would meet consumer demands and consumer wishes. Um, so I think once you get uh, past a certain size, if there's no market, if you're producing, like, I don't know, if you stop buying railroad trains, you're building your own trains because you're so vertically integrated that you've decided to build your own rail, rail, uh, railroad trains. Uh, and, uh, I don't know, lay and pr produce and lay your own railroad tracks, for example. Well, how do you know that you're doing those things efficiently? What you're producing is not in the market. You're not selling it. You're just consuming it directly, right? those capital goods are not uh, subjected to the market check. So you may well be producing those things inside your hugely integrated structure. You could, you may well be producing those things, those things inefficiently, and you wouldn't even know it because they are not in the market. You're, shield, you're, you're uh, insulated from the market by this huge integration, and therefore you start losing efficiencies, and, and lo and behold, your product becomes uncompetitive or less competitive over time. And that's why... I think Rockefeller, Rockefeller's market share declined. And by the time they launched the uh, um, antitrust act attack on him, uh, his market share was way, way below the high point of ninety plus percent. So. To sum up, if a monopoly, quote unquote, results in producers getting more goods, better goods at a cheaper price, that's not a problem to be solved. Um, in a in a free, unhampered market, there's always a threat of competition. Oh, oh, oh by the way, let's talk about cartels. <laughs> it's too early to sum it up. Cartels. Cartels is when uh, a cartel is when several firms in the industry collude. They agree to cut prices, production and raise prices together. So you don't have to be one firm to do that. You can be several firms in an agreement, acting in, a, in an agreement to try and achieve the same goal. Well, in again, in, in the free market, cartels have been attempted many, many times, and they failed very quickly every single time they were tried for several reasons. One, there's always the threat of external competition, always, okay? Let's say you were successful in reaching an agreement with all the major players in your industry producing the type of product that you're selling, right? Let's say you were successful in reaching an agreement with them. Even if there is no there is no competitor right now fighting against you in the marketplace, who says that there won't be one tomorrow? You know, capital markets are a wonderful thing. People can pull resources, you know, and every you know, a single person can become a capitalist, as in use some of their savings to invest in capital equipment by buying shares of companies or buying bonds from companies or whatever, uh, lending their savings to a, a, a production of capital goods in order to enter a market as a new company. If you don't, So you don't have to be a millionaire to start a business. You can raise money in the capital markets. Um, if, if I see an industry that enjoys huge profit levels, right, by producing a good and selling it at, at, a, at a steep, you know, a very high price. What's to stop me from forming a company? If I know what I'm doing, I can run my calculations and realize that, oh, you know, these guys are enjoying like a 50% profit rate. I would be happy with 25% profit rate. So if I do enter the market and sell at a lower price point that would ensure uh, a 25% profit rate for me, I would take away all of their customers and leave them in dust, you just completely kill them, destroy them, okay? What's to stop me from doing that? Nothing. Again, in absence of government, that could forcibly stop me from doing that, which obviously happened a million times. 
So cartels have been tried in various industries, uh, but there's always there was always this threat of competition. Um, uh, one of the first cartels I think was in packaged biscuits. There was another cartel in sugar refineries. There were always though competitors coming in from the outside, setting up competing firms, and just beating the crap out of the cartels. And the cartels would just give up eventually. Say, you know, we can't. They, they, they were not achieving their goals. They were not achieving this, you know, enjoyable position of being able to produce less and charge more and make more money and higher profits. Uh, those competitors would would destroy that idea completely. And uh, those cartels eventually gave up and uh, disbanded and just returned to just free market competition. Um, well, you may have a cartel that is being protected by the government from the new entrants, as was the case with the railroad cartels. Well, there's another factor at play there, in, 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 um, and that is the fact that the members of the cartel themselves are always incentivized to break the cartel, to cheat. Let's say, you know, you have four companies in the room, they shake hands and say, okay, we're cutting production by 25% and raising the price by 35% tomorrow, yay, hallelujah, everybody's happy, everybody goes home, and everybody on their way home thinking, okay, I'll wait for these sectors to cut production and raise prices, and then I lower I'll lower my price a little bit against theirs and raise production and take away all all of their customers. Those cartels have always been also betrayed from within. Okay, there's always this temptation, and it never fails to work. So cartels again been attempted, tried many times, always failed for those two reasons: competition uh, present or potential. Um, and also the incentive to break the cartel from within by, by the cartel members. Um, so yeah, to sum up now, I think we can sum up now. Uh, cartels don't work, monopolies don't work, as long as it's free entry. The only thing to stop uh, uh, the free entry is the government interference. Therefore, the monopolies that do exist, uh, it's very easy to see, to trace the roots of that bad situation for the consumer where they, they're, they're, they're having to pay more for less, essentially, to government, to the to the use of government force, and uh, you know, just because there's very few producers or one producer, does not necessarily mean that there's a problem. If it doesn't result in you know the cut in production and, and the raise in prices, it's not a problem, even though it is technically a monopoly because there's one seller.